Holy Spirit. Amen. We come this morning to this passage I want to think with you through just for a few moments uh, in Numbers. Uh, this interesting passage uh, about raise, making a bronze serpent and raising it up and things like that. Um, well, let me stop for a moment. Has anybody, has anybody taken me up on being able to recite the, the Ten Commandments? I don't see any takers. <laughs> well, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that in a minute. I used to, when I was a kid, I remember, well, I knew both, both places where they were. That's good. But that was uh, seven years ago. <laughs> You're the second person who's told me. They had to learn it when they were a kid, like in second grade or something I like that. Had to. Yeah. Had to. You didn't have to? Those things I did back then. Well, that was good. Well, I want to encourage us to do it again. Well, this, this, the setting for this is that they're in the wilderness, obviously. They're in that 40-year period of wandering in the wilderness. And if you can picture in your mind, this is af just after Aaron has died. And they're wanting to move from, from their location. Again, if you can picture in your mind a map, they're north of the Red Sea, about halfway between the Red Sea and um, uh, the, the, the Dead Sea. Uh, and, and so they're, they're, I don't know, 30, 40 miles, something like that. Remember, they're always walking. They want to keep going north, or maybe northeast. Edom is a little bit is in that direction, and they have a highway that runs along the length of, of Edom. And so Moses sends word and said, "Can we cross through your territory? And we want to we want to travel on the highway." And the word comes back from Edom and says, "No, you can't do that." In fact, as we're sending out our forces to make sure that you don't do that. So here's the scenario. Moses believes that they're supposed to go north, and indeed they're still being led by the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. And so anyway, because he gets that word, no, you're not allowed to come through Edom, they actually have to go south. Now the, the whole nation knows they want to go north, but Moses starts to lead them south. And they're being led by that pillar of fire or cloud, and so you can imagine why they start complaining. It says, from Mount Hor they set out by way to the Red Sea. That's how we know they're going the wrong way. To go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient. Are we ever going to get to where we want to get to go? Are we ever going to get there? Are we ever going to accomplish it? Accomplishment. And the, the people spoke against God and against Moses. Now that's that's really kind of being kind of kind of nice about it. Really, the idea is they blasphemed God and Moses, his appointed leader. And so, basically, because God is leading them, and He says, "Okay, you don't want to follow." Here's a consequence, and He allows these snakes to show up. And it says here, many people died. Now, the good news about this is that when the people saw this, they repented. That's the good news. And repentance, that's a wonderful theme in, for Lent, isn't it, by the way? We're always looking for ways that we maybe need, need to repent. And I love one of the, uh, the phrases that comes up in Eucharistic Prayer C. It's probably my favorite phrase in that whole prayer, where it says, Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for, remember this, for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Not for renewal. If we come to God just for, just for solace and not to become a stronger individual, if we come to God and come to communion just for pardon and not for that renewal, which is the continuing transformation of ourselves to become more like Jesus, then we're really, to a certain degree, we have made communion into idol worship of sorts. Now, you can go too far with that as well. But anyhow, renewal or repentance really are the, is the seeds for renewal. And so that's the good news of this passage is that they repented. They saw their error. They went to Moses and they said, we're sorry. We blew it. We, blew, we spoke against you. We spoke against uh, God. And actually, they spoke against the manna. Did you hear what it said here? He says, 
that said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and we loathe this worthless food. That's, they were referring to the manna. That was, that's a gift from God. They say, We loathe this thing. And if you, if you jump ahead a number of centuries, 14, 15, 100, 100 years, and we think about what Jesus said, He says, I am the true bread that came down from heaven. You think you were being fed by your father? He says, that man in the wilderness, that was really for me. That was me. So in a way, that was a type of pointing forward to Jesus. And they were saying, we loathe this worthless food. So you can see how they were blaspheming God. Though. So they, they did repent from that. But isn't it interesting two things here. Number one, I asked you about the Ten Commandments a moment ago because can, does anybody remember what the second one is? Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image. And what does God tell Moses to do? He tells him, make a gra in essence, make a graven image. Make a snake. Fashion it out of bronze. Put it on a hole. Put it on a pole so everybody can see it. So that when they get bit, they can look at it. You know, you can go a lot of different ways with that. I'm just going to say, number one, God is sovereign. God is always sovereign. And if He tells us to go against something somewhere, we better be sure it's Him that's telling us and not us. But He is sovereign. But isn't it ironic that something He told them not to do became the means for them to receive healing, to receive wholeness. Something that he said, don't worship this. But yet he used something like that to actually bring about uh, the healing and the wholeness for people. But secondly, secondly, and, and, and I should add, it, it wasn't magic. It was just, it was just a provision of God that re required a personal response from people in order to be able to receive that healing and that wholeness. And that's the same thing as Jesus' death on the cross. And he, made, he made reference to that. Just as the serpent was list, lifted up, he said, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. People had to do their part to receive their healing in this, this thing. But isn't it also interesting that after they repented, they came to Moses... They said, pray to God to take away the snakes, or how did they say it? It says, we have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that, the, that he take away the serpents from us. But God didn't do that, did he? No. He gave them, he said, no, Moses, you, you build this serpent, craft this serpent, stick it on a pole, and then even though they've repented, God is speaking, and now the future, he says, make the fiery serpent, you know, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. God knew people were going to be bitten. He knew that the snakes were still going to be biting people after they had repented, after they had, um, you know, acknowledged their fault. But he, even though he could have said, okay, I'll get rid of the snakes, he didn't do that. They were bitten, and they had to look at the serpent in order to be healed. And if they didn't, they died. And isn't that a little strange? I'll let you work on that as to why maybe God did that for a while. But it points to a number of things. And I'm going to share some other things with you that I've shared before, but primarily in the context of, of healing service. We have a part to play in our healing. If ever we need healing. We, we heard about healing here. We heard about healing in the Psalms uh, that we read. We heard about healing, ultimate healing, is a, is a reconciliation with God through the work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit within us. And just as this passage from the Old Testament, each person had to look at the serpent, each one of us has to deal with Jesus. And that's what the world doesn't know. And that's where we need, and this, these passages also talked about us going out to proclaim, going out to proclaim. Look at the Psalm again for that. But each one of us has something that we need to do in order to receive healing. You know, just as the manna had to be eaten in order for it to have benefit to the person, just as the snake had to be looked at, that serpent, that bronze serpent had to be looked at, had to be seen in order for it to, to benefit the individual, so are the commands of Scripture to be done, not just known about, 
but to be done, to be lived in, so that uh, the benefit of them can be experienced uh, even by ourselves as individuals, uh, by ourselves as a church, uh, as, as a nation uh, as well. The manna was no good if it was left to rot. The snake was no good if it wasn't looked at, that, that bronze snake. And so in a way, we could say that disobedience leads to problems for us, and obedience leads again to healing. Now I know that all of us are going to die someday. Unless, if, if, if Jesus tarries, which most of us probably think he probably will, I don't know, I should speak for myself, but if Jesus tarries, all of us are going to die one day. We're not going to live physically the way we're living right now forever. Realize that. But oftentimes, a lot of things that we deal with physically and health-wise, we don't necessarily have to deal with. And that's because we don't come to the Scriptures. Now let me share just a few things that I've shared uh, at, at previous times uh, in the healing services before. Let me start with a, a vision. Some of you have heard the name John Wimber before. But John Wimber was the founder of the Vineyard uh, Church movement. Uh, he passed away a number of years ago, I don't know, uh, eight, ten years ago, something maybe further back. But he was powerfully used of God back in the, uh, I guess primarily in the 80s, uh, but uh, I think he came, came to faith in the 70s. Powerful move of God through that man with the healing, healing power and presence uh, in the church. He had a vision one time. And, and again, you may remember this where I've shared it before. But he was asking God one day, why? We, we read all about healing, like this passage in Numbers. We read all about healing all through the Bible. Why don't we see healing today the way we read about it in the scriptures and God gave him a vision it was a vision of people that kind of standing around and something started coming out of the sky it was kind of a honey like substance and it was and it was getting on the people it was dripping it was being poured on the people and some of the people responded to that with joy and and wonder and and uh, just great thanksgiving that they they relished in having this this material being poured on them and they they even consumed part of it and they, they enjoyed it but others in this vision just hated it reviled it couldn't stand it started to try to push it off of themselves and get what is this get me away from here and so John in, in his prayer time he said what's the meaning of this vision Lord and basically the best as I can recall him sharing he says God told him, he says, basically, the problem's not on my end. I pour out my healing presence to all people, and some like it, and some want it, and some receive it, and others don't. We just don't. And that's where the repentance comes in. You know what God was after still in this Numbers passage, he's still building a relationship with the nation of Israel. And he said, even if... I operate in your life in a way that doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Trust me. I'm leading you. I've given you the manna. They were still living on manna. I trust me. And as you trust me, then you, you can be and will be delivered from many, many of the things that uh, we need healing from. If we jump ahead to the, to the New Testament just very briefly for a couple of verses... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, Paul writes this. He says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that you are a three-part person? Just like God is, is one, but he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are one, but we are spirit first. You are spirit. You are not a body. You are spirit. Say that after me. Say that I am spirit after me. I am spirit. You have a soul and you have a body, but you are spirit. That is the essence of who you are, all of us. And that's even why it sa he says, and may your whole, the order of that is important, may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we get sick, we oftentimes just address our sickness from the physical aspect. 
But really the scripture says, now address your sickness, really first from the spiritual aspect, from the soul aspect as well, as well as the body. Now I'm not saying you don't go to the, go, don't go to the doctor. Don't anybody hear me say that. I'm not saying that. Okay? We're not Christian scientists. That's what they believe. That you don't need to worry about the body. All you've got to do is pray and, and everything else will be taken care of. I'm not saying that. But again, you are a spirit, you have a soul, you have a body. And we have to deal with all three parts if we want to know healing. And in a way, that's what God was dealing with with the Israelites. He was getting to their spirit and getting to their soul through their body, through the snake bites. Does that make sense? Does that make any kind of sense at all? I hope it does. But anyway, this other verse that I mentioned is uh, in the third epistle of John. Listen to this one. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. The soul. Now, we are spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. The soul is also made up of three parts. The mind, the will, and the emotions. Now hold on to that. Remember what Paul said in Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. A lot of healing comes to us when we change our minds. Again, that's what God was after a bit in, in this uh, bronze serpent thing. Get your mind in tune with my mind and healing can happen. So as it goes well with our soul, we can experience healing. Mind, the will, and the emotion. Real quick, let me say, as you get two of those things, two of those three things moving, agreeing with each other, moving in the same direction, the third one will follow. Maybe quickly, maybe quite a time later, but it will ultimately, it will follow. And what, what, the, what good is, is that is if we're having emotional issues, or if we're having mental issues, we can address those things through the, the through one of the other uh, other areas. If we're having a mental issue, if I don't understand something, I don't want to do something. That's emotion more than than mental. If we say, "Well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to believe this. I don't understand this." God is teaching me, says, has a precept in here that Jesus is the only way to the Father. And if somebody comes to us and says, well, what about all the other good people in the world that are of all the other religions? Are you telling me they're going to go to hell? Are you going to say, well, they're going to have to deal with Jesus too. I don't understand that. Would a loving God do that? Well, may, maybe I don't understand it, but because the Scripture says it, I'm going to choose to believe it. That's where our will comes in. We, our mind chooses, uh, we also choose to accept that for our mind. And in time, those things and all the other things that we encounter in Scripture, our emotion will follow. And as we experience those things, we actually experience a level of healing. And even to be manifest, oftentimes, physically within us. Physically within us. The mind, the will, and the emotions, part of the soul, but that also affects the body. And it also affects the spirit. And we have control. You really can't control your emotions too much. But you can control your, what you think about, what you, what you believe. You can control what you choose to do and what you choose not to do. And that really brings me to, if, if I had told Chipper to read it, uh, it would have been different, but in Ephesians. The other passage that is assigned for today, let, let, let me just read it real quickly, and I'm going to close, close with this. It says, And you were dead, this is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. You see the things about the mind going on here, and the will? following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the, listen to this, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Here's a verse 8 that we hear a lot for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of God not the res a result of work so that no one may, may boast and here's verse 10 this is where we need healing to make sure that this happens for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them if we're going to walk in them we have to be healed in mind and body we have to be healed in our soul and that's where um, uh, healing power and presence of God is still active in the church today. If we know somebody, or maybe us, need healing in some aspect of our life, I want to ask you to go back to the scriptures and see where is it that our minds maybe need to be changed to go in a, to be in agreement with the scripture. And as we change our minds to come into agreement with the Scripture, it's not only possible, I would say it's likely. Noah, it, I can't tell you it's 100%. I wish I could tell you it was 100%, but I can't. But it's likely we will experience a level of healing, even physically. But certainly God will be glorified, and the very presence and character of Christ will become more, not only present to us, but manifest to others in the world as well. I think that's some of the stuff that, that God was trying to teach the Israelites. I am sovereign. I will work in your life and in, in the life of the nation of Israel, in our lives and the life of the nation of, of this country, the way I will. But you follow me. You follow me. You trust me. And I'll take care of things. And that can bring life and peace and health to us. Father God, I thank you for today, and I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for this episode of things in, uh, in numbers and this rather strange way that you worked that we might come to know you a little bit better. Be glorified, Lord Christ, in all that we say, do, and are, and help us to trans allow our minds to be transformed, to be more uh, in tune with you, that you would be glorified in all that we say and do and are. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray.